I'm going to say, I need you to do me a favor. Stop being committed to dead stuff. Sit down. I want to talk about committed to dead stuff. Committed to dead stuff. And everybody who's about to free say, I'm free, I'm free. Committed to dead stuff. Committed to dead stuff. All right, so let's review. And you know I'm going to say this. I want our church to be a well-learned, erudite congregation. I don't mind repeating myself because I understand that repetition breeds what? Revelation. Repetition brings revelation. I was tripping the other day, man. I don't care what nobody says. I'm not going to lose faith. My faith is on another level. I got keys. I'm going to speak this and I'm going to prophesy this. And I need three people to touch and agree with me. Lakers in eight. <laughs> Lakers in eight. I, I know the playoffs may be over, but I still believe in Jesus' name. Lakers in eight. I need every Lakers fan to just touch and agree with your pastor. Pastor, they eliminated. In your eyes, they eliminated. In my eyes, the playoffs over. I'm not even watching no more now. It's Lakers in eight in Jesus' name. But seriously, or should I say, but spiritually. Seriously, or should I say, but spiritually. Watching LeBron James interview the other day, it blessed my life. He's contemplating retirement. Now, none of us believe he's about to retire, but he's just been through a lot. This is his 20th season. His 20th, think about that, season, 20th season. He's always been in the finals. He's always went deep into the playoffs. He's always played on all-star teams. He's always played for the Olympics. His body is tired. He said, I got a lot, please put this in your notes, to think about. And I want to ask you a question. What season are you in? How many times have you been around the park? How many times have you had to deal with betrayal? How many times have you had to deal with anxiety and frustration? How many breakups you done been through? How many seasons of having some money, then losing your money, then having some money, then losing some? How many seasons are you in? See, there's two types of people sitting on your row, maybe three types of people. One of y'all are a rookie, or one of the, the second of y'all just got in the league, and third of y'all are some veterans. Now, veterans, you done been here a whole lot of times. You done seen everything you could see. Some of y'all are mid-season players. You've been in the league seven, eight, nine years. You kind of finding your way around the league. But for I discovered is a lot of us find ourselves because God elevated in a rookie season. And now you're dealing with seasons where you have a lot to think about. Once I heard him say that, man, I was on YouTube and I love just watching YouTube. And the next video popped up and this guy said, I want to show you the genius of LeBron James. I looked at it in the game when he was playing the game. He was playing against the Warriors. It came down to the wire. And at the last play of the game, he remembered a play from almost 10 years ago. He literally looked at Steph, looked at the lineup, and told AD, go to that corner. He told the other person, Draymond's going right here. Draymond did exactly what he thought he was going to do. He messed the play up so much, Draymond turned the ball over, and the Lakers won. And the, the commentator said, it's amazing that LeBron remembered that play all the way back from his Cleveland Cavaliers days. Repetition breeds Revelation. I'm going to preach this and seven of y'all going to catch it. Pastor Mike, why you keep repeating yourself? So when the devil run that play that took you out five years ago, you won't get hit with it. You'll see it coming. And, and see, I want to submit and suggest to you that many of us keep missing the mark because you do not learn a lesson off one session. That was good. You do not learn your lesson off one session, okay? I, I'm, I'm going to talk about this. I, I had to take classes. My boys right now are taking final exams. You want to know why final exams scare me? Final exam, exams scare me because had it been a test, I would have been prepared for it that week. But the final exam is a compilation of everything you learned no, not all year. Make it a sermon. All what? Season. And many of you have to understand that some of the hell that you're catching right now, the, the reason you need repetition, the reason I can't miss a sermon, the reason sometimes when I ain't doing nothing, I need to go all the way back to the first series and catch that thing because of YPMJ. Sometimes you keep flunking the exam but passing the test. 
Michael, that's what I call spiritual arrogance and immaturity. It's when you pass the test, but you flunk the exam because you did not have retention. So the reason I'm sitting in this series so long is because I'm trying to give you revelation and retention. Why you didn't put that in your phone? Stop looking at me. Put your head down. Put it in your phone. Put it in your notes. It's right there. Revelation, retention. <clears throat> Revelation, let me see something and learn something different. Retention, don't let me lose it. Yeah. Retention means it's called a tank. My staff laugh at me sometimes because they be seeing me do interviews and so many times I don't have time to stop. So me and me now just stop and get on the interview, get on the Zoom, pick up the phone, answer the questions. And they look at me sometimes and be like, how do you answer these questions so quickly? It's like, do you know the questions in advance? I was like, no. I said, but I got a tank. Y'all miss what I just said. I got a tank. I, I, I got stuff that I've learned throughout the years that I can pull from. See, whenever you don't have retention, you don't have nothing you can pull from. And what I'm trying to give you is a tank. So with that said, the first principle we talked about 17 years ago is the principle of generosity. And the principle of generosity is a heart that's willing to give that leads to a life that what? Freely give. The second principle was the what? Mindset principle. The mindset principle suggests that what I believe about me often determines what I believe about God. The third principle is the principle of what? Multiplication. It suggests that God does not simply create us to maintain, but he called us to what? Multiply. He did not call us just to maintain. He called us to what? Multiply. The fourth principle is the principle of freedom. It suggests that freedom is not doing whatever you want to do, but doing what you were what? Created to do. I want to pause and parenthetically digress because God gave me a different type of revelation about this this weekend. Uh, someone said to me after seeing me perform at the Exodus, they said, the way you're weaving in between music and messages is mind-blowing. And the Holy Spirit put a different revelation of that on me. It's called creation. Now, do me a favor. I want you to pull your hands out. Look at your hands, all right? Look at your hands. Squeeze them together. If you're watching from home, squeeze them together and I rub them together. Just touch them. Just touch them, all right? That's all I need. This generation is going to miss a lot because they don't use these. They don't use these, okay? I'm going to say this and five of y'all going to miss the whole sermon, but I'm going to say it right here. Remember cursive writing? Who remember that? See, remember when you had to literally learn how to write in cursive, all right? Some of y'all got PlayStation 5s. Your child got 17 Xbox Ones. All right, I'm going to say something that we used to play with that you ain't going to remember. Only three of us who is probably dirt poor going to remember this. Play-Doh. Yeah. <laughs> who remember Play-Doh? Now, Play-Doh, I'm going to show you how silly this is. Play-Doh was basically a glob that came in a tube. All right, you pull it out, you throw it on the floor, and it's just a glob. But the beautiful thing was it could become whatever you create. I, I want to help you right now, whatever you create. So it starts out as a ball, or you could just make it long and turn it into a bow tie, or you just do different things, or you put a penny on it, then the face of the penny would be in the Play-Doh. It, it was moldable. It was, y'all missed it, moldable. You missed it. It was moldable. I formed you from the dirt. Dirt. So, tip, so in a sense, you are Plato. And God forms and he what? Creates. Now, here's what's critical. The principle of freedom suggests that freedom is not doing whatever you want to do, but doing what you were created to do. And I said that and it blessed my life because it's impossible to create without putting your hand on it. Which means while you were being created, he had his hand on you. And what I'm trying to get you to realize is freedom does not mean I move how I want to move. But freedom is moving in the parameters of keeping his hand on me while I do what God called me to do. Am I preaching to anybody? Somebody shout freedom. freedom. Then we got the principle of partnership. The principle of partnership suggests that trusting the wrong people will make you and trusting the right people will help you. All right, here it is. Number seven, was that six or seven? I don't care. The principle of transformation suggests that my gift will change others, but my character will change me. The next one was the principle of the pick. The principle of the pick, that's the one that blessed me, suggests that who you choose to be in your life will either be an asset or an assault. 
Who trying to pick better? I want to ask this question in the comments and in the room. Who done had to go back and fix some picks? Ooh. And then last week, Pastor Darius taught us something that blessed me. I was all in the comments bragging, y'all. Everybody watching from around the world, we had a whole party in the comments. I was like, my brother just way better than yours. This boy taught us about the principle of the breakthrough. The principle of the breakthrough suggests that true breakthrough is not when you go to the next level, but when God shows you why you are stuck on your now level. I'm going to say it again. True breakthrough is not when you go to another level. It's when God shows you why you're stuck on this level. That lets us know that breakthrough ain't physical. It's mental. And what I'm discovering is a lot of y'all keep thinking stuff is your breakthrough. When if you give somebody with the same mindset new stuff, they will treat the new stuff the same way they had the old stuff. So watch this now. Somebody shout breakthrough. breakthrough. Breakthrough, if we're not careful, if we don't do our research, we miss what God is intending to teach us. Breakthrough is not a natural word. It is a spiritual word. Breakthrough was, uh, uh, the etymology of breakthrough is found in 2 Samuel chapter 5, verse 20. 2 Samuel chapter 5, verse 20 says, So David went to Baal Perazim and defeated the Philistines there. The Lord, this is enough to shout. I'm scared to say this because if this was Sunday morning, and I probably should save this scripture for the first service right here. That's what I probably should do because it says, Though David went to Baal Perazim and defeated the Philistines there, this next line just take me out every time. The Lord did it. David shouted, are you sitting on the wrong row? And that's why I can't wait to get my church back. I keep trying to let some of the volunteers and this crew come to church, but I think I got all the bougie people in this service and all the real praises online. Let's just separate the church real quick. If you're watching online, just go ahead and throw shade to everybody in the room. Just put in the comments, they ain't shouting enough. Put in there what you would be doing. If I was there, it would be going down right now because I'm living long enough and I survived enough to be able to testify it wasn't my degree it wasn't my last name it wasn't my money thank you tasha cobb jesus did it i'm in the wrong church this morning you ought to just reach over that neighbor and point to another neighbor and shout the lord did it put my scripture up there the lord did it how did you survive the pain the lord did it how did you survive the hurt the lord did it how did your family maintain unity the lord did it how are you surviving all the stuff that should have took you out the lord did it how are you still smiling when you got reasons to frown the lord did it can i put grandmama chapter one verse three on it everything that happened yeah to me that was good I just need you to touch three people and shout, the Lord did it. Yeah. The Lord did it. As a matter of fact, I'm giving you some homework. I'm praying that when God give us the green light and we get through all our inspections and we get everything we need to get done and we have our first service, I want to step to the podium. I just want to open my Bible and before I read a scripture, before I even preach, I just want to say first give an honor to God who's the head of my life, to the pastors, saints, and friends. I just want to shout. The Lord did it. I, I, I don't know who I'm preaching to, and I ain't got to wait till that Sunday to praise him. I'm going to give you 70 seconds to give your practice praise. I want you to shout like you're already on the front row. Shout like you're already in the balcony. Shout like we already seeing souls say, you ought to give God glory because everything. Just touch somebody, type and shout, the Lord did it. The Lord, the Lord, the Lord, the Lord. Sit down. That's called breakthrough. Yeah. Woo! Okay, Stefano, you almost made me have church right there. The Lord did it. That, that's your clap back for all of 2023. That's your clap back for all of 23. When they come to you, how you get that job? We've been working here in the same amount of time. I ain't suck up, I ain't kiss up, I ain't brown nose. The Lord did it. How 
time you get to be on that stage, I've been here third. The Lord did it. That's why you don't need a whole lot of friends. It's the principle of the pick. When people keep asking you why you didn't come with us, because I picked him and not them. And I knew if I had him and not y'all, y'all can recommend me, but God can select me. I just need somebody to shout, the Lord did it. <laughs> so hear me when I say this is critical. It's called breakthrough. So, so when you talk about certain things, I want you to be well learned. I want you to have knowledge. That may be the hood side of me. I can remember growing up in Central Park, growing up in Inslee, if you was in a gang and they asked you a question and you couldn't answer it, you got slapped. So I don't know if that shaped my preaching and my pastoring. I was like, no, I got to figure out. I want to be able to, if the devil ever run up on me, what's the breakthrough, fool? Uh, 2 Samuel chapter 5, verse 20. No, it's Bel Perazine. Put that in your notes. The spiritual word for breakthrough is Bel Perazine. Lord of the breakthrough, Michael. Lord of the breakthrough, Lord. All right, you want me to put B A A L dash P E R A Z I M. Bell. I got it on the screen right here. I don't know how to spell it either. I'm not. Y'all know I know how to lie good. No, it's right there. It's Bell Perazine. It's right there. B A A L dash. But it actually got a little funny thing on the front of the B. But I don't know what to call it. Is it an up, uppercase apostrophe? Whatever it is. Bell Perazine, which is Lord of the Breakthrough. Watch this. So when God gave David victory, he named it. <laughs> he said, No, the Lord did it. Look at this next verse. He burst through my enemies like a raging flood. So he named that place Baal Perazim, which means the Lord who burst through. <clears throat> I'm finna run. I, I'm not even supposed to be talking about breakthrough, but I feel my help coming here because many of y'all going to miss it. Can I give you my definition of breakthrough? Here's my definition of breakthrough. God breaks open a new realm in the spirit and brings us through. Y'all miss what I just said. Breakthrough is when God opens a new realm in the spirit and brings us through. Okay? That, that was critical. That's critical. That's critical. Okay? Because if you're not careful, you're going to think that breakthrough is something you do when breakthrough is something you receive. Michael. Breakthrough is something you receive i, I, I want to make i want to make this make sense make, make this make sense breakthrough is when god already has your solution but he brings the solution to you you grab it for a revelation then he ushers you through it watch this because you don't have the power to break it you just gotta have the power to claim it michael put scripture on it if you be still and let me break through. I got to stop. Look, look at this. So, so it's called the principle of breakthrough. I want to give you something new today. Put this in your notes. The principle of discernment. Yep. The principle, am I doing okay? Of discernment. The principle of discernment. Here's the definition. The principle of discernment is our ability to recognize the difference between what's dead and what's dormant. Because mm. most of us will fail because we're looking at something thinking it's dormant when it's really dead. Or we're looking at something that's dead when it's really dormant. And if you don't have discernment, you will try to resurrect something that only needs to be resuscitated. Mm. If something is dormant, it means it can be revived. If something is dead, it may need to be released. Put that in your notes. If something is dormant, it may need to be revived. But if something is dead, it may need to be released. Put this in your notes if you're watching, if you're listening. Discernment is the ability to see if something needs to be resurrected or released. Hmm. 
resurrected <laughs> or release them. Lord, I wish people came with an expiration date. It would be so much easier. Have you ever went to the refrigerator and got ready to eat something and you checked the date? Here's what's crazy. It didn't even smell bad and it still looked edible. But the date put you at such a place where you was like, nah, I ain't going to try it. Because the one who created it knows when it's no longer healthy for you. That's discernment. The creator of the milk, the manufacturer of the milk, said you could have it and it's good for you until this time. Now, if you eat it, pass, drink it past this day, it's on you. But the manufacturer has warned you. It is impossible to know when people should come or go or you should release them or keep them if you don't check back with the manufacturer. We need discernment because many of us are staying committed to dead stuff. Now, I want you to put that in your notes. Why do I need discernment? To ensure I am not remaining committed to dead stuff. That's good. How do I discern the difference between what's dead and what's dormant? Who wants that answer? I'll tell you. Look at the pattern. Look at the pattern. Look at the pattern. Look at the pattern. I was tripping because I pulled up to the house today, and, and it's springtime, but my, my grass looked bad. It looked real bad. I got like one patch that's solid green, then it's like 17 brown patches. Who else grass looked like? Anybody else? So everybody got green grass. Okay. God bless you. My grass looked bad. And the little bushes, they look weird, too. It's like the bushes green, and they look bad, too. Like they got like, like, like a little ringworm at the top or something. Like, what's going on with you going on, man? Your bushes look bad. And I was standing outside today because the guy was cutting the grass, and he came right before it rained. And I'm sitting there, I'm like, so what I need to do? Do I need to, like, like do I need to water it more? Do I need, do I need to put some chemicals down? And, and this going to bless your life. He said, no, the grass not dead. It's just dormant. I said, how you know? He said, put this in your notes. Dormant grass is dead in spots. Dead grass is dead everywhere. Yep. Had the grass, had my yard been dead, the whole thing would be brown. But since I had spots, I realized the grass is still alive. It just got a couple places that need to be resurrected. I'm preaching to some of y'all. That's only for three of y'all who can be honest with yourself and say, Pastor Mike, I'm not dead yet, but I do got some places that need some love and attention. That's important. Why, PMJ, put this in your notes, and I need you to catch this now. Deception will cause you to trust personalities. Discernment will help you see patterns. Deception will cause you to trust personalities. Discernment will help you see what? Patterns. That's critical. Why is that critical, PMJ? When we do not walk in discernment, we fall into deception. And many of us are making major life decisions based off of personalities. Now, what's a personality? It's what's presented. That's rich. A personality is what's presented. I hope three of y'all can receive what I'm about to say right now. A house can have personality. So even if you get ready to purchase a house, the moment you walk into it, they make the personality of the house come alive. Oh, look at the bathroom. Oh, look at how they painted the wall. It's giving it what? Personality. A car, when you go to the lot, can have personality. See, if you ain't careful, you're going to think discernment is only for who you sleep with and who you go to lunch with. No, discernment is so you can see a pattern in everything. So, so discernment is not so you can see a thing, but you can see into a thing. Am I preaching to anybody? That's critical. Why, Pastor Mike? It is so critical. Look at Mark chapter 5, verse 2. What, Mark chapter 5, verse 2. When Jesus got out the boat, a man with an impure spirit came from the tombs to meet him. This man lived in the tombs, and no one could bind him anymore, not even with a chain. Put this in your notes. Without discernment, we live illogically. Please put that in your notes. Without discernment, we live illogically. 
What does that mean, PMJ? I want to go back and parenthetically digress because I see something in the text I've never noticed in all my years of reading the scripture. Look at verse 2 and 3. I'm going to read it again. When Jesus got out of the boat, a man with an impure spirit, a demon-possessed man, met him. Look at verse 3. I've never saw this before, and the Holy Spirit just keeps making a shout at me right here. Verse 3. This man lived in the tombs, and no one could bind him, this one word, anymore. I ain't never seen that in all my time of reading it. Maybe this is my first time out of the NIV version. I normally sit around the NASB or the NLT, but in the NIV, it says no one could bind him, Michael, that can preach anymore. No one could bind him anymore. And then they show what people would use, not even with a chain. I'm preaching the three of y'all if you receive it. This brother, the demon in this brother. Notice the text does not say a demon, a demon man. It says a man possessed with the impure spirit. Because if you're not careful, many people gonna miss God. Because we keep calling them by what they're doing, not by what, ha not by what has control of them. It says no one could bind him anymore. Somebody shout bind. At home, in the room, I want you to do your homework. I want you to take some time and discover what the definition of bind is. You don't know what bind means until you got to make a child sit still who don't want to sit still no more. See, y'all ain't shouting because you ain't got no kids yet. You don't know what bind. I don't care how that baby weighs stronger than you. Ain't nothing stronger than a little kid who ready to go. And hear me, so what do you have to do? You know it's not time to go. And you know you want to sit and stay a little longer. So what do you have to do? Bind. What does bind mean? I have to overpower. I have to put restraints on. I have to keep you from hurting you. Some of y'all not locked out. Because you ain't got discernment, you don't realize God ain't locked you out. He's binding you. Pastor Mike, I don't know what to do. I feel stuck. Yes, because he has you bound. Because he realized if I don't bind you, you're going to hurt you. I'm preaching better than you receive that right there. It's like I keep every time I turn around, stuff keep going left. It's not going left. God sometimes uses trouble and pain, Michael, to bind. You pray better when you bound, Michael. And that's the problem with the church. We always talking about you loose. We're always talking set somebody free. We always trying to do deliverance. Can I free you? For some of us, and in certain seasons, deliverance ain't going to help. Because I can't deliver you from his grabs. I'm preaching better than you receive it. Come here, Jonah. Come here, Jonah, who tried to run from God. So what does God do? God causes him to sit for three days in the belly, Michael, of a whale. In other words, God didn't use a chain to bind Jonah. He used a whale to bind Jonah. Watch this. And while Jonah, Michael, is in the belly of the whale, bound, constricted. By the time the whale spit him out, he was where God wanted him to be. Because if you submit while he's binding, he will be transporting you while you're submitting. Michael, am I preaching to anybody? And anybody will shout if you will lose. If I asked who done got free this year, you would have slapped your neighbor, knocked their track loose. If I said who's out this year, hold on, Stefano, you would have been praising God. But I came to see who's mature enough to say, God, I thank you for the seasons of my life when you cuff me up. I, I don't know who I'm preaching to, and I know you don't want nobody in your business or you're watching from another city. This is why I thank God out of all the Sundays, I'm virtual. Because had I been at home by myself listening to this word, I would have told my whole living room up because I want to thank God for every no. I want to thank God for every not yet. I want to thank God for every season where I was praying like crazy. But God was like, nah, because if I let you loose in this season, you're going to hurt not just them, you're going to hurt you. See, some of y'all think that the reason stuff ain't moving the way it's supposed to move is because God mad at you. No, God loves you enough to realize if I don't keep you bound, you're not just going to tear your life up. You're going to tear everybody Michael, this brother is illogical. He's illogical. Watch this. What does illogical mean without discernment? 
Without discernment, we live illogically. Can you put that in your notes? Without discernment, we live illogically. Now, y'all got to pray for me. I, I need definitions. Okay? I want, this is what illogical means. Put this in your notes. Put this in your notes. Lacking sense. We're not going to shout over that one. Mm -hmm. Or clear sound. I'm sorry. Lacking sense. Clear, here's the one I want to shout over, sound reasoning. Michael. See, without discernment, we live illogically. And one of the definitions of illogical that blesses me is not having sound reasoning. Okay, sound reasoning, sound reasoning. I, I, I like, I miss old school TV, old school TV. These new TV shows, it's so much reality, the production ain't where it used to be. Back in the day, Family Matters and stuff like that, Steve Urkel. Remember back in the day when a person needed to tap into discernment? They showed you what discernment looks like. I'm preaching if you receive it. They showed you. Pastor Mike, what you talking about? How do I see discernment? Remember, they would get ready to do something stupid. Then all of a sudden, a devil would pop up on one shoulder and be like, you better get that and go do what you need to do. Then the angel, you remember that? Would pop up on the other shoulder. But they would be in the middle. I got a devil on one shoulder, angel on the other. I'm caught in the middle. It's me they fighting. Oh, so so there, there, there's reasoning. That's what's happening. So you got your flesh. And your discernment. And you got to pick. It's the principle. See, but when you live illogical, there is no reasoning. What do I mean, PMJ? So even if the devil or the angel is trying to persuade you to be illogical, means you ain't listening to either one of them. You going to do what you want to do, which is why the pattern of your life is you up one day down the next act a fool Tuesday but they want to be saved Wednesday it's because you are without sound reason you want to know what I discovered I'm preaching tonight when I discovered many of you won't ever be logical because you want to submit to nobody who can bind you Michael I need somebody in my life who can bind me I need people in my life who can be like, nah, you're doing too much. Nah, you need to sit down somewhere. Nah, you got too much going on. You're lacking sense. You are lacking sense. You are to be illogical. Am I doing okay? Yeah. To be illogical means you lack sense, okay? Sense. I, I got to go back not even to Revelation right here. I got to go back to kindergarten chapter 1 verse 2, 5. <laughs> senses, 5. Senses. What are the five senses, church? Taste, what else? Sight, what else? Hearing, what else? Touch, what else? Smell. That's all five of those are tools of discernment. <laughs> Smell. Some animals that have poor vision have strong sense of smell. So to be illogical, watch this, means I lack my sense. So even if I smell it and it's spoiled, I can't discern it. Even if I touch it and the texture not right, I can't feel it. Even if they show me who they are, I can't see it. See, to, look, to live illogically will have you drinking poison thinking it tastes good. Michael... No, so, so y'all don't hear what I'm saying. And what I'm trying to do is not just give you discernment, Michael. I'm trying to give you your sense back. Because some of y'all done lost your mind. And losing your mind to me means you have given up your discernment. That's rich. That's rich. How do I know this man is living illogically in Mark chapter 5 verse 2? He picks a place that is full of death even though... He is still living. Now, I want to give you a cultural lesson. He's living in the tombs. The tombs were not just reserved for dead people. They were also reserved for poor people. They would make apartments out of the tombs. And poor people could live in dead places. To this day, we still see a lot of death in poor areas. Why, PMJ? Because poverty is a type of death. 
I'm preaching better than you receive it. I don't care. I, can we be real for a minute? Stuff don't even make you as mad when you got money. <laughs> Somebody could walk up to you and be like, forget you, you fat, you black, you ugly, and you stink, but I ain't broke. <laughs> Am I preaching to anybody? Conversely, you can have nothing, and they just look at you and say, what's wrong with you? What's wrong with you? Because poverty is a type of death. Poverty, which is why I'm trying to speak wealth and trying to speak to be saved and paid over your life. Why PMJ? Because for years the church programmed us into thinking the less you had, the more holier you were. They, they programmed us to think to have stuff meant something was wrong with you. No. How do I serve Jehovah Jireh? But I don't believe that he can. Pro I'm preaching to seven of y'all right there. Look at your name and shout. You can hold on to that. But as for me and my house, oh, it's going up this year in Jesus' name. I bind poverty over every person under the sound of my voice. Not you going to be paid financially. You're going to be whole spiritually. Watch this because some of y'all got money, but you broke mentally. Some of y'all got a whole lot of mind, but you ain't got no money. I'm going to speak by faith that this is about to be the season of your life where your money, your mind, and your spirituality are all about to connect. Somebody ought to just jump up and shout, it's my season now. Because I got discernment. Because I got discernment. He picks to live in dead places. Why do you keep picking climates that don't match your calling? That's crazy. Hmm? Why do you keep picking climates that don't match your calling? I love you, but some of y'all looking at this man in the Bible like something wrong with him. You look just like that. People been telling you your whole life you were a minister. Your whole life they've been telling you you're different. You comfortable in that messy circle. You comfortable in that messy circle. Hear me, and I'm going to say this, and y'all don't even want to talk about this. God hates mess. As a matter of fact, I might, this, this week on Devo Energy, I'm going to get them the scriptures to back that up. If you go to Proverbs, it speaks explicitly about a messy person. Oh, my God. So, so why you keep going back to dead places? Because can I free you? Everything dead ain't had a funeral yet. <laughs> I'm trying. <laughs> He's living in the tombs. I want to say this and I pray you can receive it. There's certain places I just can't go no more. There's certain phone calls I'm just not answering no more. I did something this week that just made me feel so good. You ever did something that made you feel so good you really felt saved and spiritual? You almost tried to test out your powers on somebody else? Like have you ever said something to somebody and you was right? Then you almost felt like I might be on a prophetic roll right now. Let me. It's almost like a heat check in basketball. You know, you walk now, you hit one three, boom. Then you hit a second three, boom. That third, you're like, let me just see if I'm hot. Oh my God. I was on the phone this week and they started kind of telling me some stuff. Like, you know, I said, whoa, 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 whoa. I said, I don't, I don't need that in my spirit right now. So I'm going to be honest with you. I got a lot going on. I said, I love you. Then they had a nerve to get an attitude with me. Oh, oh, back in the day, you would have been laughing. I said, yeah. It's like, no, no, I just realized, no, because I'd be laughing, then I'm, I couldn't get it. Now when I see him again, I'd be thinking about it. I don't, I don't need all that. Like, no, like, let me be, because I tell. That's the part of me. You can't tell me too much mess. It's going to come out. Because Mike messy, but then Pastor Mike Jr. want him free. So you tell Mike, you know, they go, what? Pastor Mike Jr., something in my spirit. I need to pray for you. Something going on? Like, no, so I don't want to know. Leave me alone. Stay over there. And then they said, you know what, man? You're right. You, we don't need to be talking. I said, yeah. Man, I felt so spiritual after that. I went in the house, looked at the boys. Hey, don't make sure y'all ain't in no conversations. I want y'all spirit contaminated. As soon as Mike said, you heard what Mason did today? What'd he do? Did he get a whooping? I was right back. No. I'm trying to show you some of us got to come out the tombs. Somebody say tombs. Many of you can't feel tombs because we put people in the ground. 
then they put you in a to- almost like a mausoleum. That, that's the idea. But just I want you to really think like when they roll the stone away, imagine a mountain and they would just cut holes in it and then put a stone over it. Tombs. Do me this favor, and I want you to think about this this week. What tombs do you live in? Because you do know the difference between a grave and a ditch. The difference between a grave and a ditch is a body. Hmm. Yeah. Why do you keep picking friends that don't match your future? So two things I want to ask you real quickly. Am I doing okay? Yeah. Two things I want to ask you. Number one, does the climate match your calling? What does that mean, PMJ? Sierra, does, do where I am match who I'm becoming? Not who I am. Y'all miss what I just said. Do where I am match who I'm becoming? Does who I hang with match who I'm becoming? I'm finna free some of y'all. I am deputizing you. And I need y'all to feel me in the spirit. You watching me now. I am deputizing you, giving you the authority and the power to start telling people, I love you so much, but I can't hang with you because you picked them. Yeah. It's certain places in my life now where I'm starting to build teams and I need more people to be doing more stuff. And I'm seeing what God is doing here and I'm setting up different things. And I'm realizing like, no, I know where I see God taking Terrell. I know where I see him taking the D. I see where see, I know where I see him taking Rod. I need another, I need another this and another that. I need people. So I might even need this person. If I go to the West Coast, I need people here. Yada, yada. And people are just calling me. I would love to do this for you. I would love to do so. So now I'm just happy to be honest. Oh, thank you so much. But I just noticed when I looked at your page. You, you frequent with this person a lot. They tend to be real messy. And for you to love their company suggests it's a lot of them in you. Can I free you? Can I free you? Have you ever hung with somebody who smoked and you didn't? Yet when you went around your new circle, they asked that you have been Because the scent of who you were around followed you. (laughs) I can't be around y'all. You're not going to have me smelling like. Michael, y'all don't like me today. Put this in your notes. Without discernment, we live uncontrollably. (laughs) That's rich. That's rich. Without discernment, we live uncontrollably. I want to define uncontrollably. Uncontrollable. Fractious, intractable, irresistible, lawless, undisciplined, unmanageable. Look at that. What normally worked wasn't working anymore. So they're having a conversation. That's rich, ain't it? They had a conversation. Oh, I got got to pause and parenthetically digress. Oh, my God. I I don't know how I missed that. Because the scripture says he would scream all night. All night he would be screaming. Which means, watch this, he was living in dead places, but it was impacting people who were trying to live. (laughs) Because I told you the tombs weren't just where people died. People were living in them. Hear me? So think about, I want to make it look like this. I'm going to try to bring a picture to it. Who's, Who's bought a plot? Has anybody bought a grave plot yet? Okay, grave plots. So the older you get, you start buying grave plots, okay? I've been looking at them. Like, man, I want to make sure something happened to me, all us in one place at least. I ain't trying to be under there by myself. Sitting next to the Williams, I don't know them. I want to make sure I got my folks all the way around me. You know what I'm talking about? So older people think like that, though. They get grave plots. I want to make sure me and the wife next to each other. You know, just stuff like that. Okay, so imagine you had a tomb, but you ain't dead. So what you do? Rent it out. So you would let people live where you would futurely reside. So the people who were living in the tombs are losing their mind. Like, I can't get no sleep because he's screaming. This is why you got to be careful who's in your life. Because their inability to come out of stuff will start impacting you. All the mamas going to catch this. I'm preaching real good today. All the mamas going to catch this who done had a baby and the baby stay up all night crying. But then by the time you got to go to work, now the baby want to do what? Go to sleep. 
So the baby sleeping ain't got a care in the world. Now you all day what? Cranky, upset, mad because that baby impacted your peace. Can I ask you a question? Is your circle grown? They said, so can you hear the conversation? Yeah, we used to be able to at least put chains on it, but the chains don't work no more. What does that mean, PMJ? The demon kept getting stronger. What you used to be able to play with, you can't play with no more. The chains don't work. I want you to put this in your notes. This is heavy tonight. Heavy this morning. I want you to catch this now. Watch this. So, so when I say this, I need you to catch this. <laughs> when I say this, I need you to catch this. You ready for this? I want you to catch this. It's going to keep growing if you keep feeding it. And to play with it is to train it. So when I play with that demon, when I play with my issue, I'm giving it strength. I pledged Cap Alpha Psi, right? I pledged Cap Alpha Psi, and I pledged. I'm not paper. I pledged, okay? I pledged, really pledged. It was 21, 23 of us when we started. By the time it was over, it was only two. It was crazy. My chapter took pledging seriously, called the Ice and Thunder, out of Theta. It was crazy, right? Boom. And I can remember it was some nights I was looking. I was like, I ain't going to be able to do this. I probably quit seven times. Every, I, I, was, I was that person. I can't quit. Boom. And come back the next night. I'm still here. I'm still here. So i never forget when I first started going through it, I couldn't take it. it pow, hit you in the chest. Pow, paddle. Wow. I'm like, ah, ah. And I'm just screaming and crying all night. I get back to my dorm. I'm like, by the fourth week, I started pledging. Um, thank the week, the day before I left for Thanksgiving break, I crossed the last week of the spring semester. We was online forever. It was crazy. I'm, I was like, man, this is crazy. So I can remember at a certain point, I'm just sitting in my dorm like, I can't do this. Then it got easy. I got hit so many times, like my body just kind of got a numb. I can't explain it. I just got they would slap me in the chest. Pow! Search for K. Search for K. Search for K. I got locked. The affliction they were causing me started prepping me. Watch this. So my body made a decision: either it's gonna break. Or we gonna form calluses. Yeah. Yeah. So if you keep playing with something, you are gonna wake up one day and realize it is now playing you. Yeah. <laughs> the Greek word for bind means to compel or influence. So when they say no one could bind him, it also means no one could influence him. Yeah. I tell everybody close to me, and I mean this from the bottom of my heart, I don't care how upset I get, how mad I get, I want to get to the point where I can be hollering, screaming, fussing, cussing, ready to fight. If my daddy say, Mike, I want to be at a point in my life where I'm like, hmm, who can bind you, influence you? Dr. Vernon is that for me too. Hard for me to kind of act a fool in front of him. It's like, I respect his anointing and his spirit so much, it binds me. If it ain't nobody in your life that can do that, you, my friend, are illogical and uncontrollable. And I'm going to say this. You might as well put this in your notes. When you live illogically and uncontrollably, you eventually suffer tremendously. Why would God give you overflow? You're going to blow it. Why would God sing you a good man? Your mouth, illogical. Your attitude, uncontrollable. Why would God sing you a good woman? You uncontrollable. Somebody got to be able to bind you. You don't think a good woman can bind you? Ask Hulk. Ask Hulk. The movie ain't called David Banner. The movie's called what? Hulk. What's its real name? David Banner. What do we know him by? What was in him? What was in him would tear up cities until he learned how to control it. Once he learned how to control it, he knew how to use it. 
But when he could no longer control it, he had somebody who could bind him. Michael. And what would she do? She would sing a little song to him. This is biblical. How is this biblical? Because Saul would be dealing with spirits. And Saul would say, tell David to come here. David would come into the room and start singing, playing the harp and worshiping. And it would soothe his spirit. Some of y'all come to this church because there's some in you finna go crazy. And some about my crazy pastor, if it's his joke, if it's his laugh, if it's the worship, if it's the word, it's soothe. I'm preaching if you receive that. This is why I'm learning Devo energy is so important. Because no matter how bad your day is, we got a place, we got something in place now where every morning if you wake up feeling some type of way, you can just say, let me log on real quick and it can soothe. Am I preaching to anybody? The scripture says night and day. Night and day. Even in my music, um, I like to flow. I don't like being able to pre be predictable. That's how, kind of how I am. So I want to be able to do my show. And if it's something I feel like doing on the spot, let's go. And I just go to it. I didn't realize how dumb I would make my band look sometimes. Yep. So, the, so the, the crowd would go crazy and people would be blessed. And everybody walking to me like, man, God moved like crazy. I didn't realize how often I was doing that had them in a place where they was like, we don't even know what to do. We stayed here till midnight one night talking about being locked. But Pastor Mike, if we can just stay on format till we get to this point. Once you get us to here, let God have his way. And since we've been doing that, it, it's so free. I need you to catch this. See, because when they didn't know what I was doing, I spent most of my show. Go back and watch videos. It's most of my show like this. Because I would always have to talk to them. Now that we've got locked and we all know where I'm going, I don't even look at them no more. We so in tune. Hear me, that can't happen if I didn't respect them enough to let them bind me. So me getting locked to my new format, it's them being able to bind me even though I'm in charge. Because leadership don't mean you do the binding. It means you're also humble enough to realize if God puts certain people in your life, allow them to influence you. Am I preaching? Preaching to anybody. This man was unable to be bound. And the scripture says in Mark chapter 5, verse 5, night and day among the tombs and in the hills, he would cry out and cut himself. I got to stop with stones. Can I go? Can I keep going? He would cut himself with stones. He would cut himself with stones. Typically, when we are in pain, we try to find out who or what is causing it. But what do you do when you're the problem? What do you do when you can't blame nobody but the person you're looking at? What do you do when you go to the ER or the spiritual ER and your discernment kick in? Because for some of you, you think your discernment going to help you pick your career and pick your husband and pick your wife and pick your next job. I got a wake-up call for Father, y'all, which is why we may need to go into seven days of prayer on Devo Energy at the end of it. Because one of the things that's going to hurt you the most in this season is when God show you you. What do I do when I fast for seven days and say, God, show me what's holding me back? And then your face pop up. <laughs> Michael, what do I do when I ask God what's wrong with the people I love and I'm the problem? I'm preaching better than you receive it. And a life without discernment when you end up living in self-deception. A life without discernment will have you living in self-deception. And any time you live in self-deception, you will practice self-sabotage. Yeah. Yeah. No, he was cutting himself. You cut yourself to either get something out or to get something in. The only time a doctor will cut you is when they need to fix something on the inside of you. I want to free you. I want to free you. I'm a pastor, so I'm built to look at things different from a different lens, okay? And I need you to catch this. Here's something I've never heard nobody say. Every person preaches he's cutting himself because he's demon-possessed. What if he's cutting himself because the only way he knew how to get it out was physically? So what if they say, stop cutting yourself because he didn't know how to articulate it's something in me.
And self-sabotage is when you say you want something, but you do everything in your power to make sure you don't get it. Self-sabotage is when you say you want something, but you do everything in your power to not get it. Self-sabotage is when you say, I want to start the business, yet you keep going out wasting your money. Self-sabotage is when you say, I want to be happy, but you keep sitting in conversations taking trips down memory lane. Self-sabotage is when you say out your mouth, I want to be whole, but you committed to dead conversations. My God. Can I ask you a question? This is heavy. When you going to stop cutting yourself? When? When? Because two things finna happen in my life. Either people finna stop cutting themselves, or I'm gonna remove it because you gotta stop bleeding on me. Because you know what I discovered? Wine come out, ketchup come out, blood stains. I felt God on that. That's why when he died, See, you can't get, it's hard to get blood out. Even when you mop the floor, what it takes to get blood out the floor with the right light, light, illumination, revelation. If somebody walks in with the right tools to re have revelation, they can see where you cleaned it up. Even if you flick the floor, all they got to do is pick up the floor. It seeks through the baseboard, Michael. See, you can't get blood. And many of you right now don't even realize that God keeps trying to bless you. But you got too much blood on you. Because you keep cutting yourself. This brother in the tombs, ah, cutting himself, cutting himself. Pastor Mike, I ain't never cut myself. Maybe not with a knife, but... I heard somewhere in the Bible that the tongue is sharper than a tooth. So that means your tongue is a type of knife. We ain't never got no money. You know, our family don't do stuff like that. You know, I had to check somebody the other day. They was like, oh, you trying to do, you know, black people don't do that. I said, oh, no, 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 speak that on my mind. Like, no, no. Yes, we do. You just ain't met them yet. Jesus Christ. We well, you know so-and-so. No, 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 no. You know, all types of that, that, that. I know you don't move to that side of town, but certain people still ain't going to come to your church. Hey, no, keep that, keep that sword over there. Yeah. Now, I'm not going to make these cutting confessions. Yeah. Oh, my God. That was good. Cutting. That was good, wasn't it? Jesus Christ. That blessed me. Cutting confessions. It's called cutting confessions. It's when you say something out your mouth that cuts you off from the promise that God had prepared for you. God said, I'm the head. Not to tell, which means even if you're on the bottom, there's a supernatural cord tied between the bottom and the top. That if you hold on long enough, he's reeling you in. But when you start speaking negativity, your mouth cuts the cord. I'm preaching to somebody. And I came to decree by faith, you may cut me with your words, but after today, I ain't going to ever cut myself. Matter of fact, you may be sitting next to somebody or somebody's watching online who's had to live with a series of cuts. You know what I discovered? I'm for the run, right? Here's what I've discovered. Even if you get a cut, you can put some ointment on it. Michael, the anointing is sort of a cut sealer. And that's why I'm speaking by faith. God increases your level of anointing. So when people come into your life with cuts, you'll be able to speak those things that are not Michael as though they were. And I don't know who I'm preaching to, but what if for the next 60 seconds, you didn't do nothing but speak life over everybody in your section? What if you didn't do nothing but type life right there? Matter of fact, just look down your row. Don't be shy. Somebody be a team captain and just speak life. <laughs> over everything around you I speak you are blessed I speak you are healed I speak you are favored I speak you're coming out of depression I speak you're coming out of debt I speak your family is being mended 
Your son is coming home. Your daughter is coming home. Your marriage is being mended. Your mind is being set free. Every demonic spirit, every negative spirit, every lie, every warlock, every witch, every spell that was spoke over you and your children, I decree by faith. The devil is a liar. I plead. The blood of Jesus. I plead. The blood of Jesus from the top of your head down to the soles of your feet. Blood on your finances. Blood over your family. Blood in your healing. I decree by faith that I may get cut by the enemy, but I will not cut myself. Somebody shout unto God. Yay! Woo. Hear me. Cut it, sir. Cut it, sir. Hear me. So every night, he's screaming and hollering. Leslie, if you go back a couple verses, I saw something in the text I had never seen. It said, night and day, among the tombs, I never saw this, D, and in the hills. <laughs> I never paid attention to that. that. See, that's what repetition does. It gives revelation. Night and day, among the tombs, watch this, and in the hills, he would cry out and what? Cut himself. That lets me know that his spirit was the same in low places and in high places. That tells me when you ain't got it, you're still depressed. And when you get it, you're going to be depressed. If you don't deal with the stuff that's on the inside of you, Promotion ain't gonna fix it. Promotion ain't gonna fix it. A new house ain't gonna fix it. A new relationship ain't gonna fix it. More money ain't gonna fix it. Because what you need, natural stuff ain't gonna fix. What's gonna fix it, Pastor Mike? When the demon saw Jesus, it ran to Jesus. It's right there in the scripture. When the demon saw Jesus, he ran, fell on his knees. He ran and fell on his knees. In other words, I want to show you this. He paid homage. Okay, you didn't shout because you don't know what homage means. In other words, he said, props. No, the demon sees Jesus getting off the boat. Now, here's what's crazy. Me and my brother was laughing about this. Most scholars or some scholars argue that verse 8 came before verse 7. See, verse 7 said, I want you to see this. He said, he he said, he shouted at the top of his voice, what do you want with me? Jesus, son of the most high God, in God's name, don't torture me. Look at verse 8. Then Jesus cried out, come out, this man, you impure spirit. Now go back. Some scholars believe when Jesus got off the boat, he saw the spirit and said, come out of this man. And then the man ran to Jesus and bowed down. I wasn't there. I don't know if Jesus told the spirit to come out the man first or the demon ran into I wasn't there. I'm just grateful the right man got off the boat. Yeah. <laughs> Watch this. When he saw Jesus from a distance, he ran and fell on his knees in front of him. I want to pause and parenthetically digress. Can you go to verse 5, Leslie, if you don't mind? Verse 5, if you can put that on the screen. Night and day he was cutting himself. I want you to see something. Go to verse 6. When he saw Jesus from a distance, he ran and fell on his knees. Verse 7, he shouted at the top of the voice, what do you want with me? Jesus, son of the most high God. Watch this. Even the demon. Okay, I want to show you something. I want you to think critically. Always think critically with your pastor. Jesus sitting around people and he says, here it is, who do men? say that I am and Simon says what you are the son of God <clears throat> Jesus says what <clears throat> flesh and blood didn't reveal this to you and Jesus changes his name gave him a key D changed his name and said from this day forward we will call you what Peter this is where I got the name of our church. Peter Petros Rock. And upon this rock 
So Rock City isn't a place. It's a collection of rocks. It's a proverbial, in my eyes, Rock City, because we are all rocks. It's one big rock climbing wall that if people on the outside get to us, they can climb their way out of it. But Jesus says, this is critical, flesh and blood did not reveal that to you. Put a pen in that. Who do men say that I am? You the son of God. Flesh and blood. If it ain't flesh and blood, it's what? Something spiritual. So, <laughs> something spiritual. Oh, Lord, I may get in trouble for this statement, but I got to say it like I feel it. All of us possessed by something. For children of God, it's called the what? Holy Spirit. This man had an impure spirit. Why did he have an impure spirit? A demon had inhabited him. This is pre-Pentecost. Which means the Holy Spirit ain't dropped yet. So this brother was empty. Oh, Lord. So some of y'all thinking you possessed. And the question I want to ask you is how you possess when you filled. You may just be influenced. That's a whole nother, that's a whole nother discussion. Can people who confess with their mouth and believe with their heart that Jesus rose from the dead and have all power in his hand be possessed when you accept it being filled? Wow. That's a whole nother study, D. That's a whole nother theological study right there. What do I see though? The Spirit says it's the Son of God. Here's what's critical. Watch this when I say this. The demon recognized Jesus. And what does he do? He kneels. And he says, watch this. <laughs> In God's name. Don't torture me. Can I make that make sense? Don't do to me. What I been doing to him. That's critical. That's critical. I got to let y'all go. I want you to catch this. What was beating him up had to bow to God. <clears throat> and what I'm trying to tell you is God put something in you. But you got to make a decision. I'm not going to be committed to dead places. It's just certain places you can't go no more. Certain people you just can't be around. I want to help you. And I, th I thank you for standing. Let's go ahead and pray our way out of here. If you're watching at home, don't log off. This is special. The kingdom of God is not inherited by explanation, but only through revelation. Meaning when God radically transforms a person, he didn't give answers, but he asked them questions. Whenever God wants to transform you, he does not give you an answer. He gives you, he asks you a question. Adam, where art thou? Moses, what's that in your hand? Can these bones live? Who do men? Maybe you need to stop spending your whole life asking God for answers and say, God, ask me the right question. Let's talk about this. Put this in your notes. It was Zora Neale Hurston who said, and I quote, it was Zora Neale Hurston who said, and I quote, there are certain years that give answers and certain years that give questions. And what I've discovered is, Rashad, this is so good. If you are asleep at the wheel in the seasons of your life where God has given answers, you will panic in the seasons of your life when he asks questions. <clears throat> you know? 
If I ask Rod right now, Rod, what's the four? What's the six? What's the one? What's the four? What's the six? What's the one? What's the four? Six. One. You made all things new. And, and so we're able to create because he was a student in a season. So now if I ask him a question, he has an answer. He doesn't panic. At no point will he panic unless I ask him for something that don't make sense. You know? And what I'm trying to get you to realize now is many of you are panicking because you were sleeping the years of your life that was given answers. You want to know why I'm so calm so ready to open my church, man? When I say I'm ready, like, y'all don't know how hard this is for me. I love seeing my people. I love being in the lobby. I love hugging people. I like, I like, like, it's weird. I just like, I just like seeing people and loving on them and hugging them and, and all of that. And I'm like, Lord, the old Pastor Mike, forget codes. Forget permission. One of my life's quotes was Malcolm X. It is better to ask for forgiveness than to ask permission. <laughs> I would have been in this joint with no approval. As soon as the sheriff showed up, what's going on? What's going on? You're going to close a church? A church? I didn't know. I was just having church. But I wanted to be right. So you want to know what? It's good. My last failure that's Central Park. And my last failure of moving too fast and opening my mouth too fast and, and making certain shortcuts, the answer was in the failures. <laughs> but you were too busy celebrating your victories. So now when questions arise, you going to panic? Nope. Nope. I'm going to do it right. My church is going to appreciate it too. They're going to appreciate that. I want to ask you a think question. I want at home in the room right now everyone's standing even at home stand up with me I want you to stand up and receive this one am I committed to dead weight that's the first question I want to ask you am I committed to dead weight hear your pastor when I say this dead weight is heavier than living weight dead weight is heavier than living weight Hebrews 12 and 1, therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great crowd of witness of the faith, strip off, lay aside every weight. <coughs> when we don't lay aside unnecessary weight, it leads to us being weary. Wherever we are weary, we are not wise. We said this three years ago because when weariness walks in, wisdom walks out. Dead weight. Number two. Am I committed to dead ends? <clears throat> wow. How long will you stay committed to that dead end mindset? Dead end conversation. Dead end relationships. Before Jesus went into the grave, he gave the grave a deadline. <laughs> He said, in three days, yeah, da, da, my, my, shot Jesus said, before I even go into this grave, I want to let death know you got an expiration date. You tear me up, brother. This is crazy. Death got an expiration date. Yeah, da, my, shot There are some timelines that God set and other timelines we set. Without discernment, we will wait on God in seasons when God it's waiting on us. I'm waiting on confirmation. God ain't going to confirm that. That's that one on you. You know you're hungry. We ain't got to discern it. What you want to eat? Well, I don't know. Starve. I want to free three brothers right there. It ain't your choice to pick food. She hungry. If she hungry, let her decide what she want to eat. If she going to keep saying she don't know, go get you something to eat. You know. So you mean both of us got to starve because you don't know what you want to eat? 
I'm telling a joke. <laughs> I'm telling a joke. You better sit there and star. You're going to be put out. What's wrong with you, boy? But that's how some of your circles are. All y'all stuck because you waiting on God to tell you something. And God's like, no, this is your season. Set the timeline. When the book going to be done? You set the timeline. No, you don't have to pray to God on when it's going to be done. You may need to pray on him to when you release it. But you don't need to pray for God for the completion. No. 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 Dead ends are people, places, and things that lead to nowhere. Wow. Let's go home. Number three. Am I committed to dead faith? Dead faith is when we stay committed to where God was, not where God is. Dead faith is when we stay committed to what is good instead of what's God. I'm having to tell my team now, and it's been some real uncomfortable meetings, and we got a couple more to have. I'm saying, no, move that person. That, no, like, no, no. I'll take that L. If they ask who did it, say, Pastor did it. If they get upset, let them be upset. But no, I'm not doing that. I'm not doing that. In certain places and certain positions, I need total commitment. I can't be preaching courage to, courage to commit, and you have here. That's like, like, no, that means I'm committed to bad patterns, but having good conversation. Like, no, that ain't gonna work. No. So I love you, but let us just move you right now. Let's get somebody who want to do this and let's do it. Yada, yada, yada. I love you, but no, no. If I was a dead weight to you, you would cut me. So don't be mad if I cut you. Like, no, it's not, it's not personal. I'm not playing church. This is my life. I don't want to. No, no, no. No, no, no. I wish my whole church could intern with me for one week and see how many people hug me on Sunday and deal with a death by next Sunday. <coughs> one of my best brothers, Deacon Corey, literally, literally bought his mother for Mother's Day tickets to the Mother's Day concert. She passed away. She said, Pastor Mike, I never saw that coming. You'll start cutting dead weight and come out of dead ends if you realize next week ain't promised. It's not promised. It's not promised. It's not promised. That's why I need discernment, church. What if you praying for a relationship that's dead? And you call in heaven and heaven like, no, I'm not resurrecting that. <coughs> I told somebody yesterday, and I may get in trouble because I'm a pastor. They made a decision to leave. I said, I'm so proud of you. And they just eyes got big. I said, no, I believe spiritually that was dead. So what am I supposed to tell you now? Just hang in there? No, diseases are real. If you, you see something you can't handle, now you kill them and and, and now you in jail and now your kids I, I, I said dead ends are real Whew. I'm going to say this I pray you can receive it don't let your church be a dead end see I'm not immature enough to believe that where you came from was dead in a season and I can't be dead to people in a season there are certain people who have been around me long enough to now they just don't feel what they used to feel that don't mean I ain't anointing. It just means something happened in life. It's just shifted you to a di different season. Put scripture on it. One man plants. Another man waters. God gives increase. Father, in Jesus' name, I break the tide of dead stuff. God, I speak by faith. That we will lean and glean to the things that's living. God, even if it's on life support, it's still got a chance. So I'm going to keep praying for it. I'm going to keep holding on. My God, the moment is dead. Give me the strength to walk away from it. Give me the strength to let it go. God, I thank you. 
God, I honor you. God, I pray for our church. God, we may have to have a funeral for what was. Because if we ain't careful, God, old people are going to start hating new people. And old singers going to be mad at new singers. And old ushers may not like new ushers. And people who worship on the west side may get to the new building and say, it ain't the same. It's not supposed to be. It's a new season. It's a new time. It's a new day. We're moving with the cloud. So right now, God, I bind up a commitment to dead stuff. God, I speak by faith that we will embrace the growth in each other, the promotion in each other. God, I thank you right now that you're doing something fresh. You're doing something new. You're doing revival is happening. Revival ain't a five-day church service. Revival is when transformation and revelation overwhelms a group of people. God, we are in revival right now. And it's for that reason we give you glory. It's for that reason we give you honor. It's for that reason we give you praise. God, I come against old strategies, trying to flip money the wrong ways. God, I'm a tither. I'm a giver. I save. I make wise decisions. I'm not scamming. I ain't doing no get quick. God, I want to be steady, found faithful. God, I thank you for what you're doing in the lives of everyone connected to us. And we say yes. It's in Jesus' name. Clap your hands if you love Jesus, man. <laughs> Hear me. <laughs> because you're connected to a great church, and I always call our church great, not because it has a lot of people. I call our church great because we're committed to always seeing ourselves. That's why I call our church great. I love that. And I say this, and because you're connected the way you're connected, you're committed the way you're committed, I want you praying about what God is calling you to do in your personal life, you know? In your personal life. You're not who you used to be. I'm going to say this, and 75 people are going to type fire signs. Five of y'all may just holler when I say this. There are people who knew you who don't know you no more. <laughs> See, is that crazy? Hey. Bro, there are people, I had to tell somebody the other day, I said, there's people who knew me in the past who are committed to a version of me they just don't know no more. Like, literally, I'm so crazy. Now I will see people calling and purposely not answer because I got this thing happening in my life now where I guess where people stunned and they would just call. Like, you know, I can call him right now. And I, I picked up the phone two or three times and it was taking me down memory lane. Let me pause and parenthetically digress. That's one of the biggest traps of the devil. Memory lane is backwards. It means you are literally driving in reverse. Memory lane is to be going this way into uncommon traffic. The, oh, see, because life is one lane. It's a one way. Life is a one. You can't go back. Life is a one way. So to go down memory lane is to risk getting hit by what's coming. So no, I can't do that no more. No, God bless you. And I mean this. And what I'm doing now, especially with my team, with my staff, with the people connected to me, hey, I love you, but I need you to see me differently. Yeah, I'm going to run. I need you to see me differently. I'm telling my business affiliates, I love you, but I need you to see me differently. You help me in this season, but I don't want you to walk me in a room in this season. I got enough sense to walk myself in that room. No, I love you. You can be in the car, but you can no longer drive. You got me? See, so it's, see, certain seats got to change. You don't always have to kick people out your life. You just may need to change their seat or their priority level. Did you catch what I just said? If I'm running for office, my campaign manager is one thing. But one thing I've discovered a lot of times is that my campaign manager sometimes becomes my strategist or so-and-so, so-and-so. Sometimes it's very few that that person becomes your chief of staff or X, Y, Z, unless there's a sense of trust there. Because what I need you to do to get me into a place ain't what I need you to get me to sustain a place. Many of you are evolving. You are evolving. And I need you to hear me. Your commitment to dead stuff is going to delay your destiny. And what I'm speaking over your life is somebody shout grow. Grow. Type it. Shout grow. That's what God is calling you to. How you deal with your children got to grow. Some of you are committed to dead stuff with your children. You keep trying to treat them like babies. They're growing up now. Honor them. 
I'm trying my best to honor my boys now. You know, they're young men now. You know, 16, 15, 14, they're they young men now. You know, so just beating on them and screaming and punking them, I don't want to put that in their mind. So I'm trying to have real conversations. I'm drawing up contracts for my boys this summer. Well, I'm going to try to enter into agreements and teach them responsibility and how to do X, Y, Z, X, Y, Z, X, Y, Z. Because I had to realize, although they're my babies, they're young men. And if my view of them don't change, how I treat them won't change. And how I treat them won't change, they will start viewing me as dead stuff. No, I love the fact my boys come downstairs and be in the room with me. Everybody some kind of way just end up on the floor in my room. I like that. I want to make sure I keep the lines of communication open. See, what I'm preaching ain't just for the devil. It's for every aspect of life. And some of your relationships, when you go home today, when you log off today, you might need to sit down and say, baby, I, I want to pause. Don't say nothing. Just listen real quickly. I want viewing you right. Yeah. I still had old pain in my heart. So I didn't even realize I was committed to dead patterns. It was even hard for me to love you because I was just waiting on you to leave. So you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to go ahead and put my heart out there. If it get broke, God amend it. But I'm going to just trust. Now some of y'all don't go home and do that. That's why you got to have the principle of discernment. Discernment. And that's what I'm trying to... Um, that's what I'm trying to drive home with us now. You get what I'm saying? Where are you? And in every area of my life, I'm starting to have those conversations. And I speak that over your life, man, that you can have those conversations. Real conversations. So and so, hey, I love you. I don't like not being able to do this. I don't like, no, I, I want to be able to be free and say this and do X, Y, Z, yada, yada, yada. Come out of that. Can you receive that? Clap your hands then, man. Wherever you're watching from, I'm going to say this. Maybe you don't know Jesus. Or maybe you can say, Pastor Mike, this church bring me life. Here's a good place to put confetti in the comments and the shout. 2,200 people have given their life to Jesus this year, man. That's crazy. I'm excited. If you don't know Jesus, you can text home to 28950, man. Falling in love with Jesus is the best thing that has ever happened to me. God's doing a lot in my life right now. It's overwhelming, honestly. I mean, it's, it's overwhelming. Uh, this morning, I woke up. I had to take um, Xander to football practice, uh, to workouts. And um, I took him, and on my ride home, I just kind of drove slow. And I uh, literally just cried all morning this morning, just crying because God's just blowing my mind, man. I mean this. But the most important part was I'm just so glad he did it at this, at this season of my life where it just don't, it don't change who I know God, who God called me to be. Had God did all this in my life seven years ago, it would have consumed me. I thank God he bound me to Birmingham. Y'all don't hear me. So many doors were opening and my team would tell you opportunities were coming seven or eight years ago and it was hard for me to say no to them. My friends looked at me like, you stupid. Them doors don't open forever. But the Holy Spirit told me, sit still. And I'm grateful now God put the right people around me. And I want to speak that over your life, man. God has a plan. And when you know God has a plan, you don't mind submitting to his timing and moving at his pace. So I love you. Give your heart to Jesus. I believe we're a great church. If you're looking for a great church home, not a perfect church, but a great church. I'm telling you, man, this would be a great place for you to come. Listen to everybody watching at home. Thank you all for being patient with us. You see the footage right there. This place is becoming beautiful, man. The children's wing is looking great. The hallways are looking great. Um, I got convicted. I was like, I want my church to have the best of everything. I busted up all the bathrooms upstairs on the main level. So even if you went up there today, I bust, ain't nothing in the bathrooms as we speak. I broke up the tile. I took the stalls out. I looked at the toilets and said, my people not going to use old toilets. We put brand new toilets in there, man. I'm telling you. So I don't know, whenever I tell you to come to church, 25 of y'all need to get here first and be the first person to sit on the toilet. You know, I'm old and I'm ghetto. I said I was going to go to each toilet in the room. Right, let me try this one out. It's good right here. Look at what God is doing. Go to the next. Look at what God has done. No, so I'm excited. I told him I want a nice, pretty mirror right there, a big mirror so you can take good bathroom selfies at church. 
all that, man. You see that? So even in the sanctuary right now, the stage is almost done. And as we speak, as I speak, they are literally upstairs right now installing all the speakers. And you may see this footage. I looked outside. I just did not feel like it was enough parking. I mean this. And I just don't want those issues ever again in life. God blessed us to where we met a company. And this brother was so kind to me. And all that stuff and he was like pastor mike i got you let's go so they are literally installing another parking lot as we speak at the church right there <laughs> i always wanted this so i'm gonna tell you what it is i always wanted volunteer parking you know because we be here a long time so i always wanted a parking lot strictly dedicated to our volunteers so imagine when you get here, you'll be able to, boom, park in this certain parking lot we're going to have. You show your badge. When you get there, you go to the volunteer parking lot. The golf cart going to bring you on over or the van bring you on over. You get downstairs. It's going to be refreshments waiting on you, a place to put your stuff. We want to make sure we do it the right way, and I'm excited about that. So listen, hold on just a little while longer. When I text you, it's on. Let me clarify that because clarify that, somebody said this to me at Wendy's the other day. They said, when you text, it's on, I'm coming that day. I was like, no, 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 no. If I text you, it's on, you got to wait till the next Sunday. Somebody said, you say it's on on a Wednesday, I'm coming to church on a Wednesday. So, no, I'm excited about that, and I just, I can't wait to see what God does next. If you're giving, you know how to give. Be faithful over your giving. I'm a tither. I have never in my life beat God's giving, no matter how hard I try God keeps just blowing our minds, and I believe by faith it's falling on your life too. That's how you give. It's right there at the bottom of your screen. I love you. I'm praying for you. Father God, in the name of Jesus, I pray a simple prayer, and that's, Lord, your will, nothing more, nothing less, nothing else. It's in Jesus' name we pray, and the entire church said, amen. I love you so much. We are Rock City. God bless you. We'll see you next week. Clap your hands right there. DMJ wow. is back. <laughs> he is back. The principle of yeah. the sermon. That really blessed me. The, the ability to be able to tell the difference between what's dead and what's dormant. Yeah. What needs to be revived and what needs to be released. Ooh. That was an amazing word, as our pastor does each and yeah. every single week uh, here at Rock City. And maybe you say, you know what? That really touched me. I, I want to. That's my pastor. Pastor yeah. Mike is my pastor. I want to be a part of the Rock City family or give my life to Christ. You can do that by texting the word HOME yeah. to 28950. You see it on the screen. That's HOME to 28950. Five zero. We would love to have you be a part of the Rock City family. Over 2,200 souls have already been saved just this year yeah. uh, through the ministry that God Amen. has given to, to us. So we would love to have you be a part of that. And if you're giving today, we have several ways you can do that. Uh, yep. How would you? How do you do your giving? So I love text to give, right? Yeah, so anytime that, that check hit, what I do, pull out my phone, 28950, I rock in the amount. Yep. And Boom. you see all of the numerous ways on the screen. Yeah, we're able yep. to reach so many people because of your generosity that's right because of your support because of your commitment and faithfulness to what God has called us to do uh, listen little becomes much when we put it in Ooh, the hands come of on Jesus. Now, you're preaching. together you're good, we're able to reach the world so let's commit let's stay committed and faithful in our giving so that God can continue to do the great work that he is doing yep. tomorrow morning tomorrow morning we yes. got D Bo Energy. Energy. That's right, right. It is Memorial Day. So yeah. It is Memorial Day. We have people Shout out to the seven. Monday Squad, Pastor Darius. Monday Squad, Pastor yeah. Dino. Uh, yeah. 7 21 a.m. Central Standard Time. And y'all, don't forget, don't forget them two words. When you see yeah. it, it's on text, just know that it's on and it's going to be rocking in Rock like City popcorn. at the new church. Yeah. You know we got the parking lot I'm behind I'm about to go us. get to work in just a few minutes. Hey, they go, they go. not yeah, ready. I'm going to do yeah. some inside work, indoor work. Get a little hot out here. <laughs> but y'all, we love y'all so much. We will see y'all tomorrow morning. Until yeah. then, peace.